point person at their place of employment, will have specific policies of how to address these issues when they take place in the workplace. So there is a format. What employers need to do and understand that they should clone that format into dealing with issues when their employees are subject to any type of harassment, uh, whether it be internally, it does not need to be sexual harassment, or whether it's coming externally. So I think that you know there there is a at least a a, um, a base that you can use for employment for employers who've been dealing with the sexual harassment issues they need to. Okay, uh, and setting policies and procedures um, is the most important thing. If you set policies and procedures which are clear, detailed, and well defined and enunciated, then you have a head start because you. But you can't just take a policy and stick it on a shelf. I mean, a lot of employers do that. What you need to do is you need to have a policy that's clear and detailed, and make sure that it's reviewed annually that everyone new who comes in understands what this is and sit down. Because people aren't going to come to you unless they feel comfortable, unless they know what the policy is and it's clear, defined, and detailed. Once they have that, then hopefully, uh, they will not only be able to reach out to you, but management and other employees who see the symptoms of someone who may be subject to domestic violence, working with them, who feel safe enough to report to the their employer, and then the employer can be proactive, and hopefully be proactive early enough so some of these issues that you talk about of what may be coming across in the workplace, whether it be on the computer, uh, on their cell phones, uh, or, or whatever it may be, they can intercept early enough. And if if you have an employer that is proactive, are there um are there obligations that they need to adhere to in terms of contacting law enforcement? Are they allowed to? Are they not allowed to? How does that happen? How do we turn around and if I come to you and I have a problem, you're my employer, um, what are the obligations as an employer uh, either advising me to contact uh, law enforcement for assistance or? Well, I'll let them talk on the criminal side, but on the civil side, the obligation of an employer when they learn about something is to create a safe environment. Now, what's a safe environment? It really turns on the facts of what they try to do. But, you know, they should make sure that if they can make reasonable accommodations, uh, uh, something that's borrowed from uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, a reasonable accommodation to the work of the person, uh, they should be able to make those accommodations where they put them in a safer place inside the office space so they're not near a door in case anyone comes in that's uninvited. If they can take them away from maybe uh, a use of the computer then in, in, a, in a segregated place of the telephone, those types of things, uh, actions employees can take. Also, by giving them certain leave, um, and there's a whole host of laws which not only on the federal level, but on the state level, are uh, being looked at of uh, allowing uh, people who are in this situation to have time off from work, whether they need to get away for a while, whether they need to deal with uh, uh, court appearances, or, uh, or whatever it may be. Um, employees need to be aware of that. Um, there are some cases, there are, excuse me, some states, and I think California is the lead here, where employers are given the same right uh, as individuals to go in and get restraining orders. Uh, not only restraining orders against employees who may be uh, subjecting someone to domestic violence, but to go get a restraining order from someone, a third party outside, who's subjecting their employee to domestic violence. Uh, these are pretty broad uh, powers that uh, are given. Uh, you know, this was it just a short time ago where, uh, in, even in Massachusetts, to get a restraining order, there had to be a relationship. Uh, uh, between uh, the parties, uh, and that now you don't need to prove that type of relationship. You just need to prove what what the result is of the relationship that is existing, and that's is causing this uh, harassment. So things are moving in that direction. There's only ten states that have those types of laws right now. Uh, Massachusetts doesn't have that as of yet, um, but uh, certainly it's something that's being addressed on the legislative side. Criminal side, uh, it's a pretty normal course when someone gets a restraining order that the person is supposed to stay away uh, from the workplace. So if that individual who's a defendant on the restraining order shows up within 100 yards of that workplace, uh, that's enough for a violation of restraining order. You could be arrested for that. So anytime you see someone who has a restraining order, if that defendant is just lurking around the building or uh, even 
trying to contact that calling man, uh, you can report that to the police and that can be a violation of restraining order. Just to add um, one thing about victims being embarrassed about disclosing this information to employers, we've had so many victims that get they get the restraining order and it requires them, the, the abuser, to stay away from their place of employment, but the victim is too afraid or too embarrassed to go forward to their employer and give them a copy of the restraining order, or just tell them about the restraining order, or give a picture and say, if you see him here, he's in violation of the restraining order, he's looking for me, the police need to be called. And it's funny, because a lot more of the victims are much more um, open to the idea of giving, because usually batterers are uh, not allowed to go near their children's school, and they're much more open to the idea of giving this restraining order to their children's school, but it's very, very hard for them to just go to their employer and say, I have this restraining order, there's something going on, and you know, if you, if you could help me be proactive about keeping this person away. So I mean, that would be one of the first steps is just to create an open environment where people feel comfortable saying, hey, this is going on and I got this order. And they may not even have to tell you anything else about what's going on, but at least you have that knowledge base to start from. I mean, it may, it may be as, as broad as giving that picture to the security guard, right. putting in new, new security. Um, I always I had a uh, an irate husband of a client of mine who came in one day to um, I don't know what his intentions were, uh, but he was certainly not uh, too happy with me, uh, nor his uh, spouse. And uh, he came through the security, and uh, they wouldn't let him in. And in his his rage, he called the police because he thought he had a right to come up to the law office and see me uh, and of course the police that thank you for calling the calling the police on yourself uh, we're gonna escort you back to the station now and talk to you so um, they, they're not always the uh, the clearest thinking in the judgment but uh, we have a decent amount of cases where the guy will be arrested standing just outside the front lawn because it told the state from the house and they'll have the restraining order in their pocket they'll just be staring at the house uh, and they don't understand and those, nature of it, and then they'll get arrested just standing right there. And those are great cases for us to prove, and same thing with the employers, because a lot of times victims aren't ready to go forward with the case, they're not ready to testify against their abuser, but if he's out front of the house or out front of the workplace with a restraining order in his pocket, and you see him there, or a police officer comes and sees him there, that's enough for us to prove, prove the case, hold him accountable, and not put her in jeopardy for testifying against her abuser. Well, you know, and this is, this is interesting because, again, I think um, it, this is interesting because I think uh, there there's the added issue of when um, sexual orientation and people that that maybe are gay and not out in the workplace then have an additional uh, hurdle that they mentally would have to get over and, and come to terms with before they can they can out this. Um, let me ask a question, Al. Can we, as employers, can we ask employees about uh, restraining order issues? Like unsolicited to say, hey, if people have restraining orders, uh, uh, please come and talk to us. Or, I mean, I can't imagine that, but it seems like that's no. the direction that we're going. What you need to do is, like I said earlier, is you need to have uh, create an environment and a channel of communication where the employee or a fellow employee, a lot of times this happens with a fellow employee reporting that the person next to me is getting phone calls 50 times a day from the same person. I think there's something going on here. She's going in the bathroom, she's crying all the time. Uh, she's you know leaving early, she's coming in, and you know there's, there's a certain, a lot of, I'm sure you people are more familiar than I am, you know, the signs of someone but it, uh, going through this, but empl other employees need to feel comfortable that they can report to the employer with any type of retaliation, not to them, but to their fellow employee who they're trying to protect. Because there's case laws where there is retaliation, and you know people have had to sue for wrongfully being terminated because they took actions to protect themselves, and the employer didn't understand the situation, refused to understand the situation, but looked at it as not being something in my my business interest, so they terminated the person, and the person needed to. Uh, you know, bring along for termination lawsuit. So you need you need really an environment and a channel of communication just right from the beginning. So not only employees but their fellow employees will feel safe and comfortable to bring something like this that they see to their employer. And, and you know, it's funny because uh, we were talking earlier. Actually, all of us were talking a little bit earlier about the idea that, that this really is going across all socioeconomic classes. Um, and in particular, 
uh, with the economy the way the way it has been, horrible. Um, uh, you have um, you have people at, at the at the lower end financially afraid to say anything simply because they need the jobs. They 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 are maybe supporting everyone in the family or or whatever else. And on the higher end, you have uh, the same type of embarrassment. People saying, "I'm a uh, I'm I'm a." Powerful woman CFO of a Fortune 500 company, and not—I uh, I can handle this myself. I don't have a venue out, or I'm a, a you know the successful salesperson, VP of sales for a company. Uh, I can handle. I can handle this. Or if I say anything, will they think lesser of me? And I think this is a, a concept that that we want to start to address. And, and I think programs like this, obviously, people who are here, uh, employers who are here, are, are people who are sensitive to those types of issues, and that's why the education process needs to go wider and wider to all employers. And uh, do you ever work 